Hi, my name is Sharon Chen. This video is part two of tuberculosis infection and disease and focuses on the pathogenesis and clinical manifestations of active TB disease. The learning objectives are to describe the progression of tuberculosis from latent to active disease, to correlate the cellular and molecular events in the life cycle of MTB to clinical findings of tuberculosis disease, to describe characteristics of the host that increase the risk of progression to TB disease, and to describe the different manifestations of pulmonary and extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Recall the timeline of TB infection from when they first enter the alveolar macrophages to control of replication during latent TB infection. What keeps MTB from actively replicating and bursting out of the granuloma? First, within granulomas, MTB bacilli are trapped in a relatively anoxic condition. MTB replicates poorly in these conditions because they undergo aerobic metabolism. Second, granulomas are not static structures. They are quite dynamic and can be heterogeneous at different sizes and states even within just the lung. Granulomas may expand from MTB replication and potential escape. MTB-specific T cells stop further progress by maintaining activated macrophages that kill any potentially escaping MTB bacilli. Granulomas may also shrink and calcify if all the MTB bacilli have been killed. If TB granulomas are disrupted, latent TB infection progresses to active TB disease. You will hear this progression referred to as reactivation. I will use the word progression in this video because it is more accurate in terms of pathogenesis. MTB is not truly latent as one thinks about with herpes virus, so it then does not reactivate. People with active pulmonary TB disease usually have symptoms and signs of cough, prolonged fever, night sweats, anorexia, and weight loss. An old name for tuberculosis was consumption, referring to the weight loss. Chest pain, hemoptysis, and supraclavicular adenopathies are signs and symptoms that occur less often. Untreated, 70% of non-HIV infected people with TB disease will die. One third will also demonstrate extrapulmonary disease. What determines whether a person does or does not progress to active TB disease? The answer is not completely known. Something disrupts the granuloma, disturbing the standoff between MTB and the host immune response. This disruption can be observed more often in certain types of hosts, so we can recognize that some people are at higher risk of progressing from latent infection to active TB disease. For example, HIV AIDS increases the risk of progression to TB disease by an enormous amount. An HIV-infected person has a 10% chance of progressing to TB disease per year compared to an immunocompetent person who has a 10% chance of progressing to TB disease over a lifetime. Age is another differentiating factor. There are three high-risk periods for higher risk of progression to TB disease. Infancy, those less than 12 months old, adolescence, and the elderly. There are forms of immune deficiency that should be considered when assessing risk of progression to TB disease. Several are listed on the slide for you, and these people have a higher risk of progressing to TB disease compared to an otherwise healthy person. I would just point out one of the more recent additions. Recall that I mentioned that TNF-alpha is an important pro-inflammatory cytokine produced by macrophages in the granuloma. TNF-alpha inhibitor medications are being used more often to treat autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. Patients on these medications are at higher risk of progressing the TB disease. Diabetes is another quite common systemic disease that dysregulates the immune system and increases risk of progression to TB disease. This is an increasingly important host factor as more people are diagnosed with diabetes. So what is exactly happening at the level of MTB during progression to TB disease? Recall that I said that T-cell activated macrophages can kill MTB. They do this by producing lytic enzymes and reactive metabolites, some of which can spill out as the cells die, and the end result of all of this activity is tissue necrosis. The tissue necrosis is incomplete, forming a semi-solid acellular material that has a cheesy consistency, so it's called caseous necrosis. Caseous necrosis can erode into a nearby bronchial airway, creating a cavity. These cavities now have an aerobic environment, optimal for MTB to replicate, and loads of up to a billion of bacilli can be found. 
with more MTB replication and more inflammation, the caseous necrosis liquefies and casium with high concentrations of MTB bacilli discharge into the airway. In the person, discharge of the MTB-laden casium irritates the airways inducing cough, which may be a productive cough of bloody sputum if a blood vessel has been damaged. On chest x-ray, a cavity can be seen. On the chest image that you see on the slide, you can see a cavity in the upper right apex of the lung. This is a common location to see cavities from TB disease. The exact reason is unclear, but one theory is that the upper lobes have increased oxygen tension, allowing optimal MTB replication. Pulmonary TB disease can also progress to other clinical findings in later stages. For example, infection with the pleura can result in large pleural effusions, as you can see in this chest x-ray. Endobronchial and endotracheal infections can occur as MTB is released into the airway, and you can see one of the lesions in this image. Higher up in the airways, laryngeal infection can occur rarely. I've just described the pathogenesis and clinical manifestations of TB disease. So now let's review the timeline again. We started this part of the discussion during latent TB infection. Recall that this is a phase where MTB may be surviving within the granuloma and the patient is asymptomatic. At some point when the standoff between MTB and the host immune response is disrupted, latent TB infection progresses to active TB disease. Active TB disease involves actively replicating MTB, producing many symptoms in the patient. The time to progression to active TB disease can be very short or can be very delayed with a range of two months to a lifetime. Pulmonary TB disease allows MTB to complete its life cycle, exiting its host and then transmitting to another human. Although TB infection does not equal TB disease, and only 10% of infected people progress to active TB disease, it is sufficient to maintain a high level of TB transmission in the human population. Recall those scary numbers of TB infection and disease in the world that I mentioned before. However, the most feared and morbid complications actually do not directly lead to transmission. These are the extrapulmonary TB disease complications. Recall that during primary infection, macrophages and dendritic cells can carry MTB to distant sites. The same process of granuloma formation, latency, and then progression to TB disease can occur at these distant sites. Virtually any organ can be affected. I'm going to highlight some of the more common clinical manifestations of extrapulmonary disease. Lymphadenitis is the most common extrapulmonary disease manifestation. TB lymphadenitis is termed scrofula. Historically, this was caused predominantly by M. bovis from drinking unpasteurized cow milk. The anterior cervical chain is commonly affected. As opposed to lymphadenitis from other more common bacteria, TB lymphadenitis tends to be painless, slow-growing, and can have a purplish hue to the overlying skin, as you can see in this image. TB disease can also affect the spinal vertebrae and causes a spondylitis with an eponym of Potts disease. MTB destroys the disc and extends into adjacent vertebral bodies. The destruction results in a gibbous deformity, as you can see in this photo. The image of the vertebral bone shows you the destruction of the vertebral body and the resultant collapse and deformity. TB meningitis is a major complication in infants and has nearly 100% mortality if not treated. Inflammation of the meninges at the base of the brain, the red arrow points to the area, causes obstruction of CSF flow and results in hydrocephalus, enlarging of the ventricles, as you can see in the CT scan image. In infants, TB meningitis can also be associated with miliary TB, which means that MTB has disseminated to multiple distant sites within the lung and in the body. Chest x-ray with miliary pattern in the lungs looks like this. You can see numerous tiny nodules all over. Here's a close-up of one. The word miliary comes from millet because the numerous tiny nodules look like millet seeds. All of those tiny nodules are small developing granulomas throughout the lungs from widespread dissemination of MTB throughout the body. Many other organs can also be affected, and I have listed them on the slide.